The Epitome Restaurant and the E2 Nightclub were located at 2347 South Michigan Avenue here in the city of Chicago. For almost two decades, these various dining and entertainment businesses served our community without any serious incidents. In the early morning hours of February 17, 2003, that all changed. A sequence of events combined to produce one of the most horrific tragedies in the history of this city. 21 people died that night. Within hours, however, the city began a cold and deliberate process of deflecting any responsibility for what had happened, blaming four men for everything. However, when you put what happened that night nearly seven years ago into its proper context and consider the timing of the events, a different story begins to emerge. The E2 tragedy was the first real test of Chicago's first responders in a major emergency and the accident occurred during the height of the anthrax scare. Unfortunately, the public's understanding of the incident, shaped mostly by early news accounts, was colored by the horror of 21 deaths and the city's quick pronouncement of who was to blame. No one has asked simple, basic questions such as, how did 21 people die after more than 100 police and fire personnel arrived to rescue them? Watch and listen for the next few minutes, and then you decide. Pay close attention to the actions of the Chicago police and firefighters and see for yourself how much of their actions were aimed at controlling the patrons on the outside of the building rather than trying to rescue the desperate people trapped in that stairwell. To make matters worse, once they realized how badly they had blundered, they immediately began a systematic campaign of disinformation and distraction that deliberately stymied the media and used the grief and despair of the victims' families and the survivors to divert attention away from their own tragic failures. All along, the city has claimed that the club was open in direct violation of a clear court order to be closed. The logical argument then is that if the club had been closed, then this horrific tragedy could never have happened. The fact is that is simply not true. The court never intended to close the club, and the city of Chicago knew it from the very beginning. The judge's own half sheet, those are the handwritten notes that the judge uses personally to keep track of the court proceedings, verified this. He wrote, by agreement, Le Mirage will not use second floor VIP rooms. That was it. That is all he wrote about the court proceedings on July 19, 2002. Despite all the hype and all the explanations, that is what he wrote. And for seven months, everyone, including the judge, the corporation council, the building department, and its inspectors, the mayor's liquor license commission, the Chicago Police Department, the Chicago Fire Department, the building owner, and the club owner acted accordingly. The club advertised openly on radio stations and newspapers, hardly the behavior of people who are trying to keep quiet that they are operating illegally. And the police continue to assist in closing on the weekends. In fact, the club's licenses were renewed by the city of Chicago in November of 2002, during the same time when the city later claimed the club was closed. On Sunday evening, February 16, 2003, the first patrons arrived at the E2 nightclub shortly before 10 p.m. At about 2.15 a.m., trouble began when suddenly a fight broke out in the middle of the floor. According to witnesses, Wood was heard alerting security to use mace to break up the fight and Team One security guards responded quickly by spraying pepper spray on the offenders. More than 30 calls were made to 911 and the minutes that followed. As the panic increased, calls and wild claims were made to the 911 operators each hoping, perhaps, that by exaggerating the extent of the emergency, help would come more quickly. 
can't understand you. They won't let you out of where. It's Chicago, Illinois. Your phone is breaking up. Incredibly, Hello? there was still mass confusion and what can only be described as a communication breakdown among these first responders. This fact is clearly evidenced by the fact that it took some 30 to 40 minutes for an effective rescue operation by the police or fire department personnel. In fact, listen to the scathing memo by paramedics who was at the scene. I have to say it was a cluster. I'm not sure whose fault it is or exactly how to change it. I can say that if it was a terrorist attack of some sort, we have learned absolutely nothing from New York City. Let me also tell you that we had no idea what type of incident we were going to. Two firemen met halfway between the actual building and our rig and they were carrying a young girl. They plop her on our bed and she is in cardiac arrest. I asked where she was shot. Of course, assuming this was a shooting, they said she wasn't. I then asked what they had over there and pointed to the incident building. They said we have 15 more cardiac arrests. And I asked if they knew why, and they said no. We arrived at Cook County Hospital. They didn't even know we were coming, had no clue an accident was occurring. They asked us why, and we told them what we knew, which was nothing. This was now 45 minutes after the beginning. You could still hear on the radio that people were still being removed as red. No one ever mentioned these people were sprayed with mace. No one ever mentioned they were trampled. Hell, we didn't even have our board or collar for the patient. I don't think anyone did, and I am very upset that this was allowed. How could there be such chaos? More importantly, how could this rescue go so wrong and no real investigation has been done? Several news outlets would later report that firefighters downstairs on the first floor of the club who responded to the initial call were out of radio contact with fire dispatchers who tried several times to draw their attention to the stairway where people were trapped. Out of radio contact with dispatchers. The city's own records show that its first responders fell victim to faulty radio communications. While people were still being rescued from the stairwell, police officers, instead of assisting, invaded the office of the business with garbage bags and removed business records and contents from the premises including thousands of dollars in cash, which, by the way, was never recovered. They also removed the computer hard drive containing the security system video images of everything going on that night. Within only a few hours of the tragedy, while some were still trying to locate loved ones, city officials, knowing that there would be lawsuits, quickly tried to deflect responsibility and pronounced the owners of the club at fault. Marco Flores, the party promoter, apparently boarded a plane from Mexico that night. The fire commissioner reported that emergency exits had been locked, preventing people from escaping, resulting in many deaths. This was not true, and he later retracted those comments. The disinformation campaign had swung into high gear, and the untruths were reported as facts. Time after time. City officials contradicted themselves. Mara Georges, the corporation counsel, repeatedly referred to the need to punish the building owners before they learned that the building was actually owned by Leslie Benedon, who by some mysterious means was never criminally charged by the city. We therefore leave you with these questions for your consideration. If this was a building court action, why was the owner of the building never charged? Do you believe that a real investigation into the nature of the city's response to this tragedy would shed any additional light on why so many people died? What do you think the city's potential liability is for the failures that we've documented? 50 million, 75 million, 100 million? What has the city done that would indicate that they care about the well-being of the children that have been left behind? At the end of the day, the city of Chicago is attempting to deny any responsibility and to place all the blame on other parties so it won't have to pay for the lives that were lost. And for the city that works, we can all agree it didn't. Think about it.